couple of weeks ago, one of my followers left me a comment asking if I had put together a video about managing suicidal feelings. Last night, I watched a video by my sister, who is a mental health campaigner, volunteer. She actually volunteers for Calm, which is a male suicide prevention charity. And she's a YouTuber, and so she vlogs about mental health. I'll put a link to that video in the description below. She said that we just have to talk about it. Like, we have to end the stigma and we have to make it okay dialogue. The irony is that I deal with this week in, week out in my work as a counsellor. We talk about suicide completely openly. It's not uncomfortable. It doesn't feel like a strange thing to do because that's one of the places where it is totally safe to talk about. I think suicide runs on a spectrum. We all know we're going to die and we all think about death. If you imagine that zero is never ever thinking about suicide and a hundred is being right there in the face of suicide, it's perfectly plausible to think that all of us might ponder over what it would be like to end our life and we all have thoughts that pop into our head where our imagination runs wild about all sorts of interesting and peculiar things and suicide might be one of them. We might very well be driving along in a car at 70 miles an hour and think, I wonder what would happen if I yanked down on the steering wheel really hard and ploughed myself into that crash barrier. We might all see a really tall bridge and think, I wonder what it would feel like to jump off that bridge. Not all the time and not regularly, but just here and there, those things pop into our head and we just wonder, just like you might wonder what it might be like if you could get in a spaceship and travel to the moon, or what it might be like if you were to be a movie star for the day. I don't think that thinking about those types of things are any less normal than any other thought you might have pop into your head because I think we all have an imagination and we all wonder about stuff we don't know about. So that's at one end of the spectrum. And at the other end of the spectrum you have people who actively plan how they are going to end their life, they prepare for that moment and then they execute that moment and they end their life by suicide. Sometimes it doesn't work out and doesn't go to plan and they end up in hospital or have a near miss and survive that attempt but have attempted it and that was the idea or that was the plan when they did it. So I think you have a complete range from having momentary thoughts to committing to the principle that that is what you are going to do with your life. The problem occurs when that thought becomes too attractive. Let me give you a little bit more information. We experience countless challenges in life and by human nature we adapt to those challenges and we find ways to cope with them. Depending on the amount of love we have in our life, the moral guidance that we have, the support systems that we've got around us, our own personal levels of self-esteem, that kind of thing, depends on whether or not the outcome and our coping strategy that we formulate for ourselves is a healthy or unhealthy coping strategy. Our brain doesn't stop to consider whether it's healthy or unhealthy, it just wants you to cope and survive. We are built to survive. Let's say you experience people as rude and hostile and you get bullied and you get judged, that kind of thing. A coping strategy might be anger. You might find that you get very defensive, you get very angry. If you're an angry person, it wards off the danger of people. Therefore, people don't come into your world and into your bubble and they don't attack you, you are safe. And you come across as really hostile and not very nice. However, you are very protected and therefore you are, as a human being, keeping yourself alive. So that's kind of how a defence mechanism or a coping strategy is developed. What would happen is that that would become problematic for you and you would get to a stage where actually you're losing friends, you're feeling very isolated, you're not very happy 
And so you decide that you need to find a new way of coping and you embark on therapy and you work through better management strategies. With somebody that is suicidal, exactly the same thing happens. So at some point they have one of these thoughts about, oh, I wonder what it would be like if I ended my own life. And they perhaps spend a little longer pondering on it than they have previously. And they think, do you know what? If I wasn't here tomorrow, I wouldn't have to contend with the things that are in my head today. Therefore, I would feel relief. And they start to create a dialogue around what that would be like for them. It's common for people that are suicidal to feel very guilty about things that they have done or think they have done. So for example, you have stolen from your family or if you've been to prison or if you have robbed or if you have been violent. All of those things can leave you feeling a deep sense of discomfort about who you are, what you've done to the people that love you. And you think to yourself, well, they would be better off without me. And so then not only would you be relieved to not have to think all of those things anymore, but they would be relieved because you would no longer be in their life causing those problems and making them feel bad. So you attach a second strain of thought. You add another strain to the thought. And if I go and carry on tomorrow, I'll have to deal with this. And I know I've got that coming up and that thing will be happening. And I don't feel that I've got the internal energy to take one more day or one more bad scenario or you know, I'm expected to be doing this tomorrow and I don't have that in me. I don't, I don't have that reserve anymore. And you think, well, again, if I didn't stick around, then I'm not going to have that to deal with as well. And I'm saying this like, it, like I'm just kind of clubbing it all together and making it sound so simple. This is not a simple topic. This, if, if you're a person that is in this scenario, these thoughts don't sound really kind of like, right, like how I've just described them. They sound, they are, they are in your brain. They are constant, they are loud, they are hostile, they are not, they are toxic, they are horrible, all encompassing. They, they can eat you up, they can drain you, they can make you feel empty, they can make you feel overwhelmed, they can make you feel depressed, they can make you feel frightened, you, they're not, I'm, I'm describing it so that you have the theory behind it, but to live it is a completely different experience. You get to the point where you have this going on inside your head and when you think about it, you feel relief. You feel that if you were to do that, you would have a good sensation. Because as humans, instinctively, we are designed to feel better and to take care of ourselves, the good feeling that we get from thinking about suicidal things actually starts to become the thing that keeps us going, it keeps us alive, it, it, it gives us something to hold on to, it's the thing that we're fighting for, like that feeling. Many, many people that experience suicidal thoughts and feelings and it's called suicidal ideation, will, will kind of, in their head, they'll move there and they will feel a sense of comfort and relief and calm and like they've created a solution for their problem and that they've created a solution for all the problems of all the people that they have inflicted this on. Not that I think they have, but they will think they have. That becomes their positive. They don't see anything outside of that in my experience of working with people with suicidal thoughts because this is all happening at a chemical level so this is releasing endorphins and serotonin so when they're thinking about this they're getting a a chemical release that feels good so they have no reason to believe that that's not the right thing to think they become trapped in this thought process and they don't see the bigger picture or what's going on on the outside. They only see, well, this feels better than when I don't think about this. 
Which leaves everybody in a tricky situation because people can become convinced that suicide is the only option, it's the only thing that's going to make everything okay. Whereas to all of the bystanders, so the people, the families, the friends, the support teams, the counsellors, the GPs, everybody around that person that cares about that person, that loves that person, that wants the best for that person, doesn't think that that's the answer at all. They think that, you know, they want to support, hold, contain, they, they want to make that person better, they want to be the thing to take away that person's pain. They don't want suicide to be the answer, that's the last thing they want. They don't want to lose that person, they love that person. But there's a complete disconnect. The person feeling suicidal absolutely can't comprehend why they would be worthy of life and they can't understand why anybody would want them in their life anymore and the people around cannot understand why somebody would not want to be there anymore and that is why people experience suicidal feelings and that is why people find it so difficult to give up and step away from being suicidal because it actually gives them something positive and it takes a lot of work to talk that through over many hours to the point where the person can then start to see reason and logic beyond that. My belief is that the only thing that is crucial for somebody who is suicidal is for them to talk. I genuinely believe that talking is the best way to help someone that is suicidal. The information I've just shared with you underpins how we would explain what is going on for somebody that's suicidal. If I were to work with someone that's suicidal, I would hold and contain them. I would let them tell me how they're feeling, acknowledge how they're feeling, and put myself in their shoes to understand why they're feeling that way and reinforce that the way they're feeling makes sense because of everything that has led up to that point. I wouldn't bulldoze in there and say, but you're thinking the wrong thing, what you're thinking isn't the right thing, don't be so silly. And I think my sister's right, we do need dialogue. We need dialogue around how to talk to people that are experiencing this. We need to have dialogue around how to hold someone's hand and be there for them emotionally. People need an awareness of why somebody feels this way, which I hope this video is giving you. People also need an awareness of how to support them. Just listen. Having that thought acknowledged can be more powerful than getting them to agree to something that deep down they can't do anyway. You could get them to say, promise me you won't do that. And they'll go, yeah, sure, no pr problem, I'll, yeah, I promise you. And then you find that they have made an attempt. Whereas if you say, I really hear you, I really, really hear how tough this is for you and I hear why you feel the way you do. And if you get a high intensity of feelings again, come back and tell me again, because I want to be here with you. Say something like that. Be there where they are and that will be a hundred times more supportive than trying to tell them that what they think is wrong. They need love and they need support and they need to talk. I can't stress that enough. Absolutely enlist the help of a therapist or a counsellor or a mental health team. They're not there to think you're crazy. They're there to help do what Joe Bloggs can't do. And if they do end up making decisions about residential mental health care, it's purely to keep you safe whilst you start to work through what's going on. And if you're the person that's feeling that, I want you to know that you're normal. It's perfectly normal and natural and a human response to try to keep yourself emotionally okay. And that is what feeling suicidal is. That's all it is. It's just that 
you happened to buy into the idea that an end would give you relief in exactly the same way that an agoraphobic person buys into the fact that keeping themselves away from things gives them relief and safety. In exactly the same way that somebody that suffers with anxiety and panic attacks unconsciously thinks that by having a panic attack that shuts them down and then they are not in a position to deal with the stimuli that is taking place. None of these things happen because someone wakes up one day and thinks, ah, I know what I'm gonna do today, I'm gonna think this because that's a great thing to think. This happens when there isn't a healthy alternative. So you develop your own way of working it out for yourself unconsciously it's not your fault, it's not a bad thing, it's natural, it's human nature, but it doesn't have to be that way. It really doesn't have to be that way. There are healthy alternatives, there are safe alternatives, there are people out there that really want to help. How did you find that? How does that now make you feel about feeling suicidal? How does that make you feel about people that you know who are experiencing suicidal feelings? Have I opened your eyes to anything new in this video? Has this changed your perspective on suicide? Please comment and let me know if this was helpful. This channel is full of mental health hints, tips, advice, information. So if you like the style of delivery that I'm giving you, then please subscribe to this channel and I will see you soon. Thank you.